Sending positive vibes to all truth seekers. Welcome to the Library of Humanity podcast. Here we're looking at the faceless man from Game of Thrones, the philosophy of the ego. And what does it mean to be faceless? That is going to be the question in this podcast. So we're looking at the Bravo. In Bravos, there's the House of Black and White, where Arya Stark goes and wants to be a faceless man or a faceless woman. So the main question in the philosophy of the faceless man is this. Who wants to be faceless? Right? It's, it's, it's the ego. So we're going to talk about in this episode that the face is going to be like the ego. So who wants to be faceless? Right? In, in the show, Arya really wants to be faceless. But Arya is her ego. So that, that is the paradox that you want to be faceless. Right? So in spirituality, people who want to be faceless or have no ego, they're not going to end up becoming enlightened. Because it's the desire. Becoming a faceless man or enlightened is having no desire at all to be faceless. That is, the, that is the paradox of the search, is why, why would you want to be faceless? Because everything good for you, your ego, is the opposite of being faceless. Because faceless is, like, is, like, is the death of your ego. Facelessness is, is death for your personal story. So your personal story is the face, right? So Arya in the show... She has lots of grudges against other people. And a lot of us also hold grudges against other people. When you do that, it is your ego wanting to revenge, right? It is, it is the story of me. So another way to talk about face, having a face or an ego is me. So for Arya, Arya is trying to avenge all of the things that have happened to her in her past. And she believes in her mind and her thoughts that she, that she deserves to have this justice, right? So that's kind of the negative side of justice is when you want to avenge certain things that you perceive as bad. Bad things that you perceive that have happened to you in your past. So one of the main things that we, that we try to get over, over in our, in when we have a face and when we have an ego is the idea that Things in our past weren't supposed to happen or were supposed to happen. So it should have happened or it should not have happened. So things like regret. Um, it is your ego that, is, that wants to regret the things that either did or did not happen in your life. And that is very egotistical because that is going against the facelessness. And the facelessness is ultimate reality. is being. And in the, in the show, in Game of Thrones, they talk about the multi-faced God, the many-faced God. So the many-faced God is the, the connection or the spirit between all people. So it's the thing that connects all people. I don't know what they mean in the show. In the show, it doesn't go in quite enough detail to know exactly what they mean by the many-faced God. But it is, it's, it's God's will. Right? So that, that is the thing that has the free will is the many-faced God. Um, and that you could think of as the universe. That's one way you could think of it. It really depends on your perception of, of religion. Like, are you atheist? Are you agnostic? Or are you uh, just spiritual and non-religious? Or do you practice and adhere to a particular religion? So that is the word that you would use. So you, you want to use the word that is most comfortable for you. For a lot of people, that is God. Um, for me, I, I use God um, not too often, kind of sparingly, because I don't, because I know the power of that word that other people have uh, compared to other people when they're kind of religious. They, they want to use that word as the idea of God and not actual actuality of God, the actualness of God. Um, and to be so facelessness or the many faced God, 
we cannot ultimately use words to describe what that is. It is, it goes beyond human, all human concepts and language. So when, when we have a face or an ego, we are using language all the time to, to talk about our story. Um, and this is the sense of I am, the sense of me. Uh, so we're going to use the, the phrase I am and me as a little bit different. They're, there's, they're going to be a little bit different because me is the perception of your life story and also the, the agenda. So one of the main things with, with ego and having a face is this agenda that you're pushing into the future. Um, that you, and the agenda is this, that you, you're the body or the body, mind, and soul that you have. So it is yours. That's how you perceive it, right? The body, mind, and soul wants to continue its story into the future. So ultimately, egos are almost all about the past and the future. And it's not about now. It's really not about now because it is, it is creating a story. And in when you read a novel, it's almost always about the past and the future and not really what's happening in the now moment and the now moment without any interpretation of that now moment. So, uh, so the, the face of the ego loves to interpret always, always interpreting, and the, the second that you interpret um, what is happening, it is no longer what it is. <laughs> so <laughs> so in, interpretation is not the thing. It's really, really important to know. Like, for example, when you're translating for another, from another language, right? So like the ego translates the now moment. So when you're translating from another language, like, if, for example, I, I speak Spanish pretty decently, um, so when I'm trying to explain, uh, when I'm trying to translate from Spanish to English to another person, it's actually not the same thing. It's literally not the same thing. Um, like when you, when you say like la silla, which means the chair, no, I'm I'm saying la silla. <laughs> that's that's different than the chair. Um, so you cannot you cannot translate directly from language to language, and it takes away. It takes away like the Spanishness of the world. <laughs> like when I, when I speak Spanish, for example, I see the world in a particular way. Uh, I don't know if it's because I learned Spanish in Ecuador where and in South America, where everything kind of seems a little bit more magical and kind of exotic because I'm not I'm not Ecuadorian, obviously, I'm American, and because that because of that. When I was living in Ecuador, everything seemed kind of exotic. And so that's why I have a connotation of the Spanish language with kind of the, the magical, the mysterious, and the exotic, and the beautiful. So that's why Spanish is actually, I, even though I'm not very good at Spanish um, compared to a fluent speaker or a native speaker, uh, I, I prefer Spanish over English overall and how it's structured and how it makes the world just seem kind of magical. And that's just my opinion. I don't know how other people perceive Spanish. But anyway, so it's all about it's all about the ego interpreting the moment. And it's it's taking away the essence of the moment. So let's think of an example in 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 Game of Thrones. In Game of Thrones, Arya is always again thinking about she's always like strategizing about her 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 best interest so her ego's best interest and but that's not looking at god's will right so so one of the characters well, um, well you don't even need to say his name it's 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 the it's the guy at the house of black and white um because he's a faceless man right so this is what's difficult is his character name is jock and hagar i don't know if i'm saying that correctly uh, I'm not a huge Game of Thrones nerd. Uh, I usually get the my information on Game of Thrones from my roommate. But Jock and Hagar, we actually can't call him Jock and Hagar. Because he's faceless, right? He is enlightened. He is the enlightened being. Uh, so when we say Jock and Hagar, that's not what Jock and Hagar is. When, 
Because we are perceiving Jock and Hagar to be a specific way from our interpretation, right? We are not a faceless person yet, right? Maybe if we are striving towards spiritual awakening, for example, like me, I, I'm really pushing, I, I want to put more effort into it, but I'm really pushing towards spiritual awaken, awakening and enlightenment and being in my life. Well, it's not even my life. It's just I want life to occur without all of this interpretation, interpretation from this, this Kyle, this me that, that is interpreting reality. I, I see the suffering that that, that, that uh, creates and engenders. Um, so going, I'll, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna continue on that topic in a second. But let's go back to the to the idea that you can't call Jock and Hagar Jock and Hagar, because there there isn't a Jock and Hagar, right? There's he's he's faceless. There is there is only facelessness. So again, we are we are portraying from our ego perspective, we are portraying that Jock and Hagar is separate from facelessness, but he is facelessness because he is, he is it. <laughs> he is not he. So as, as soon as we think that Jock and Hagar is this he or a person, we're no longer, ta- we're no longer talking about him. So I, I can't tell you, ultimately we can't use words to say what Jock and Hagar is. We can only say what he is not, and he is not Jock and Hagar. So um, that is what's really important with language. Language is extremely tricky when we're talking about enlightenment and spirituality, because it's limited. Again, all of these, all of these, um, I guess reality. This reality is much more complex than our language can symbolize it. So language is just symbol, is symbolizing something. But what is the definition of a symbol or, uh, or a model? Okay, so we're, we'll look at these words, symbol and model. Uh, look them up on the dic- in the dictionary. Look, look at the definition. A symbol and a model are basically a, a something that it tries to represent, but it is not the thing. So it is not what it's trying to represent. All right, so... It's, that's very important because, we, like for example, when we look at a, uh, like a photo of an atom, right? we look at a photo and we think that's what an atom is. It's like, no, that's not what an atom is, right? It's, that's a map of the territory or it's a model. Um, like in mathematics, for example, there's lots of models, uh, but the model is just a concept. It is not reality. Reality is... Just snap your fingers, right? You and clap your hands because that's what reality is. It's silence. It's un, it's un, it's inconceivable. Uh, yeah, inconceivable, unconceivable, <laughs> inconceivable from our little ego perspective. So when you are not yet faceless, you constantly have this desire to interpret complexity and oversimplifying that complexity. Because the nature of reality is just so complex. Um, we could get into that as well, why it is so complex. It's also not just complex, it's also paradoxical. Okay, so let's, let's kind of get into paradox here. Um, so we're kind of looking at Jack and Hagar, and we can see that his, his existence is so complex because... And this goes right back into paradox because he is Jock and Hagar and he is not. So the, the term that I will use and we'll get, the term that I'll use is a faceless, faceless face. He's a, he is a faceless face. And that is a paradox, right? So if you look at, uh, so if you're, it's looking at the opposites of two things. So if you look, if you say, blackless black, right? So you're saying that it, that the black is black, but also not black. And that's what a paradox is, is when you're saying that something is and it isn't simultaneously. So th- these ideas, um, you can get a lot by learning through Zen. Okay, so from my perspective, the House of Black in Game of Thrones is 
a symbol or a metaphor for a Zen monastery. I would guess that the creators of, of Game of Thrones watched documentaries or read quite a bit about Zen, Zen Buddhism, but that's another topic. Is Zen Buddhism or is Zen just Zen? Okay, for, for these purposes, let's just keep Zen in and of itself. So Zen represents the house of black and white. It, in the essence, in, in House of Black and White's essence, it is exact, exactly like Zen. For example, um, Arya gets hit a lot uh, with, a, with a stick, or a, yeah, a stick. And that happens a lot in Zen monasteries. Very important. So in a Zen monastery, uh, the Zen master <laughs> uh, asks you a question, right? For example, he might hold, he might hold an orange in his hand. And he asks you, what is this? So someone's telephone is ringing. Um, the telephone, it is a telephone, but it is also not a telephone. So that is the paradox we're looking at. Okay, so the orange, so it's exactly like the orange or the telephone. And the, the Zen master asks you, what is this? And immediately, because you're not yet faceless, you're like, it's an orange. <laughs> right? Duh. <laughs> Are you stupid? And then boom, you get hit. You get hit right, in your, right on your back or you get or you get hit by a stick on your shoulder or something or even on your head. In the show, uh, in Game of Thrones, Arya gets hit in the face, right? She's super tough. And act, but I think her toughness, her, in my opinion, her toughness gets her in a rut for not becoming faceless. Because she perceives herself as tough. Like, you know, I'm this tough little girl, you know, I, I can, I can uh, go through, I can get through anything. Um, but I think that is a big barrier to her becoming faceless. Um, right now, I'm not yet on, finished with the show. I'm on season six. So it's, I'm, it'll be interesting to see where she heads in her spiritual development of what she is. But from my perspective, I don't see how she's going to become faceless. Because she has such a big ego and has a lot of baggage from her past and her future. Um, and that can happen if, so if, if she went to a Zen monastery. If you went, think about if you went to a Zen monastery and this crate, you would perceive him or her as crazy Zen master. Um, traditionally, they're men. But now, of course, men and, men and women. There's a lot more Zen happening in, uh, in the United States since the 1960s. Um, but traditionally, of course, the Zen comes from Japan, and it's full of traditionalism. Zen is full of traditionalism um, from Japan. But now it's there's now it's kind of opening up a little bit. But that's why I, I would I would say if you're a true spiritual seeker or truth seeker, study Zen and really dive into it. But don't identify as Zen. Very important. As soon as you identify as anything including your face. Don't identify with your face because that's not what you are. Don't identify with being Zen or I'm a, I'm a follower of Zen. I practice Zen. No, no, just, just find that Zen is interesting because you're going to attach to that, right? Zen is, Zen is a beautiful thing. It's just that the, the, any good Zen master would say, don't attach to this. This is not worth attaching to because you'll no long you will not become faceless you will not become your you will not see your true self or you will not become the nothingness so facelessness is a lot like in zen they have the idea of emptiness and nothingness so how do you go from this idea of a face so you are your face you are this something how do you go from this something to nothing and the nothingness pervades everything. So we perceive, this is how as an ego you perceive the world. You perceive the world as separate from you. And not just that. So, so you, are a, you are a something. And there are many, many somethings outside of this something of you. And that is how we are conditioned in the world. We are conditioned by our family and friends growing up. And we're, we are taught by our culture, basically, about this separate, separateness, this duality. That's another, that's another word to use. 
besides se separateness, you can say duality. And that's very important because that idea of separateness and duality is going to get in your way because the goal is to see that you aren't something. You are nothing. And this, the nothingness is what every quote-unquote thing has in common. That is the only thing that everything has in common. Everything, everything is nothing. Okay. But also, but that's the first step. So I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. The first step is to see that all of these somethings, all of these somethings in life, including oneself, is nothing. Okay. And how do you do that? Uh, you stop thinking. You have to stop thinking. That is the only way. <laughs> and how do you stop thinking? In Zen, it's all about sitting, just the just sitting method. Okay, so let me kind of demonstrate for that for you a little bit. Um, or I can also point you to my video on uh, I, I sit in silence for one hour. And so the, the name of that video is, oh, I can't remember the name. I gave it kind of a weird name. But anyways, kind of the demonstration is sitting up straight in silence. And you watch your mind become quieter and quieter. And in this silence, um, you identify with the silence, right? So you, don't, you no longer identify with the self. You no longer identify with me or the face. You identify with facelessness. Facelessness, again, is nothingness. So you, you just, instead of saying it, you just realize it. You realize that I am nothingness. So that's kind of going back to th this idea where me and the I am are different. So me is, again, the story of the past and the future that has an agenda to perpetuate its, ex ex its existence. And then the I am is is what is always in the present. I am is always now. Very, very important. I am is here now. And it's always here now. And that here now actually, here and now, never leaves. Because it's impossible not to be here and now. So that's the key with facelessness and I am, is that it's always here and now, right? So we have to identify with that here and now-ness, this facelessness. Because in the here and now, there, there are no faces. Because the interpretation of the now moment, again, that, that, is, that occurs in time. Our, that, incur, that occurs in our perception of time. Our, percep our perception of time from the ego perspective is past and future. So we have to go beyond that past and future. And the only way to do that is by existing now and here. And the, the words here and now can't explain what here and now is. So you have to go beyond the words of here and now. That's why you have to go beyond Zen. Because Zen is a concept. And Zen is a concept that's full of people, full of faces. So, but Zen is a good map, I would say. Zen is a good map for the territory. But it's not the territory. The territory is the facelessness. The territory is here now without saying here now. Okay, but you're going to get, we are going to get lost because of the, the thinking, the thinking self. Okay, so I haven't actually talked about this a lot, is the thoughts, our inner, our inner thoughts. So for Arya, why she will not become faceless is because of her thoughts. That is ultimately what's going to happen why she won't ultimately become faceless. Again, I haven't seen the whole series. Um, I don't know if, I don't even know if in, if in season seven or season eight, she's still at the House of Black and White or still in Bravos. So that um, I'll have to wait and see. But I don't see her becoming faceless. Or if she does become faceless in the show, I think the authors of, the authors have a weird interpretation of who can become faceless. I think there's a really select group of people who are ready to become faceless. It's people who have, you have to put in work, 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 work. And it's paradoxical because 
why why is that paradoxical that like to become faceless you have to work at it but it's your face that has to work <laughs> so you, you see that like this weird connection between facelessness and face so you want to become faceless but your face is in the way so what do you do with that face when you want, want to become the facelessness okay what what do you do well i'm asking you who are you what are you what am i what what am me what is me what is me right so if i ask myself what is me and i ask you what are you cuz i'm saying you you want to become faceless but you don't become faceless you is not that thing that becomes faceless facelessness is nothing but the idea of me and you is something <laughs> so you're starting to see all of these disconnects right uh but they're actually not disconnected you have to embrace these paradoxes embrace it you have to love it you have to live in paradox like for example nothing and something is the same you have to see the nothingness in the something and that's the paradox right like right now i'm looking around the room and i'm seeing somethings a lot of somethings but what is the all of the essence of it right so then i look at myself so that myself i see something i think myself is full of somethings and it's not just one thing so that actually helps me see that i am the nothing because i'm just an a, a amalgamation i'm just a connection between hi john uh i'm making a video <laughs> i was i was wondering what was going on <laughs> that's all right i, I was untold <laughs> no problem uh so the idea with this nothingness is seeing all of these things as the nothing and that is going to be the paradox so that and again we have to embrace that paradox so ultimately with face facelessness it's the only way to be that is not to want to be that you can't want to be that faceless so that that is what's going to get in the way of our spiritual spiritual awakenings is the desire to want want to be that and the desire is going to spring from our thoughts so it's very important so all of us have thoughts that are going to get in the way but whose thoughts are they it's very very important whose whose are whose thoughts are they you would say that they're oh they're my thoughts but what is what is me right what is me and you see that me is just something that is the story the story of the past and the future so kind of to to wrap up this vodcast is going to be a little bit of a shorter one usually they go for about an hour but to be really really precise is is silence so facelessness is silence that is here and now very important whenever whenever we're believing our thoughts whenever our thoughts are believed by us that's going to be a trap and when we're believing in anything right the, the belief in a 100% of a physical world that everything happens and everything is physical um that is that is a belief that's going to hold us back or even the belief that everything is consciousness then you're you're not willing to open yourself up to the physical world too so that's that paradox where things are everything is consciousness like empty consciousness and things are these physical things that are happening in this newtonian physical world so uh it is it is a beautiful paradox <laughs> and it's not life it is existence it is life but it's also existence those are not quite the same thing but we have to open ourselves up to living and existing here and now without talking about it without having the desire to articulate that okay so that's it uh comment below if you have questions 
or if you want to nerd out on Game of Thrones, that's fine. I don't know too much about Game of Thrones. I'm just uh, a casual watcher of Game of Thrones. But I am, I'm an ardent searcher of truth. So please, if you have questions on truth, comment below. Uh, like this video. The more that people like this video, this type of message goes out to the world, goes out to us, goes out to we. So we are all the same. We are all connected in this consciousness, in this, in this oneness, right? The, the non-duality, the oneness of all. And when, when we're opening ourselves up to this paradoxical view of life, this beauty of life, that is what is going to connect all of us. And that is the internet, the internet YouTube is that, is this connection between all faces to become faceless. Right? YouTube is one of the good one of the good sources to open yourself up to facelessness. All right, peace. Have a good weekend. Peace.